Um, and so without any further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Tahir Saif, uh, who is going to be speaking with us today about living machines of the future. Can I share the screen? Yes. Do you see the screen? Do you see my screen? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah, let's see. I will go back and there you go. So I have taken a completely different style today compared to what I used to do because Kaylee, you asked us to not talk about what we have done, but to think about the future. Right? So that's what I tried to do. So if it doesn't make sense, so be it, right? This is among friends. So <clears throat> living machines of the future. So I, you know, naturally, I had to think about what we have done. But before that, I wanted to think about, uh, I can see Ron is having his lunch. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, I thought of, you know, we talk about machines. Uh, so why not we think about where, where did we start with machines? So uh, this is a data that I got uh, from the GDP, British GDP per capita. And the GDP was kind of low in terms of pounds, as you can see. But then here comes the Industrial Revolution, uh, started around 1800s, went all the way to about mid, mid 1900s. But you notice that when the Industrial Revolution started, that's the era of machines that started. We started to get into more and more mechanization. And once that hit, the GDP went up significantly. And I checked the global GDP exactly the same way. It had a slight delay. But again, it had the similar, very large, fast exponential growth. So we know machines of today everywhere, you know, they're hard machines, big machines, robotic machines, they're, they have really changed our world. But what really changed, this was eye-opening for me. Uh, this is the first time I saw this as I was looking into this rise of GDP. So most of us have studied Malthusian economics somewhere, sometime in our high school or economics classes. So in the Malthusian theory was that as population begins to grow, there will be a point where the population growth cannot be uh, fed with the resources we have. So the population cannot keep growing because eventually there'll be a stop because the resources will be too, too low. So some Malthusian economics, if you look at from the year, so the, the, the population was growing up, you know, the uh, as time progressed, but then, then we come to a point where the, the rise of population was making so fast that we should have trapped, we should have been trapped with the Malthusian theory. We should begin to see the lowering in the population, but that didn't happen. The population went up, GDP also went up, the lifestyle has went up, uh, the life, life quality has gone up, the expect, life expectancy went up, and they all coincided more or less the same time. This is the middle of uh, 1900s. And recall the industrial revolution started around uh, uh, early 1800s all the way to mid 1900s. And that's where the shift happened. So we got out of the Malthusian trap. And this was very interesting for me. The machines came about beginning to influence life and that changed the way uh, we thought about how the civilization would progress. Of course, machines of future, some of this came from MIT's Cheetah project. And so it began to tell us that the machines could begin to, we can begin to think about machines which would see their en environment, they could sense the environment, they could make some sensing actuation, feedback control, things like this. This was still elementary, uh, because it can do so few things on its own. Um, in fact, there is a video, maybe it'll be fun because you guys are from MIT. And if you have, I'm sure you must have seen this video many times, but what's interesting is, is if I go move forward, forward, forward. So you can see the object coming forward and you can make a decision to jump. So I, I move forward, but I don't need it anymore. Um, so, so then 
the ideas of soft machine came into play. And again, this is uh, from George Whiteside's group. So they could make inflatable objects. They could can put pneumatics, uh, air pressures, and you can make things grab and move uh, just by, by designing the geometry of the soft objects or the soft machines. But also we know that there had been some effort since uh, middle of 2000, again from George Whiteside's group uh, and, and a few others, where the idea that the machines could be hybrid uh, can be also possible. So uh, the idea was take living cells and put on substrates that are flexible and uh, but pattern them. So the substrates would have, in this case, the cardiac cells, they would, they would pattern and they could, you can apply electric field and then they can move and came machines of this type, which is a walker, at least uh, this was 2007. Uh, and more recently, again, with cardiomyocytes, uh, there were this Stingray, this is 20, 2019, I believe, just, just a couple of years ago. And here you apply, again, you align the cardiomyocytes and you shine light and then they move. It's 2016, not 2019. Um, so the idea was that you assemble by putting cells on a soft substrate. But then we came into this game from Ibix and we thought that we don't want to assemble anymore. We just put them together and we put, take a substrate, we put the cells, cells will interact with one another, cells will interact with the scaffold and the cells could be neurons, could be muscle cells, could be endothelial cells, you name it. But we don't want to assemble anymore. Let this work by themselves. So that's where I think we begin to think about uh, emergent machines where self-assembling is not needed. And of course, we produce this all kinds of machines. Some can walk, some can swim. Uh, some may have neurons and muscles together and they can swim uh, by neurons firing on the muscle. So this is the history now. And yes, we can in the sense that we can make machines where we throw cells on a scaffold, mostly on the small scale. Uh, and yes, the cells co-emerge with the cells uh, co-evolve and make these machines walk or move. So now, when I look back, I realize that there are things that has happened in the EBIX that I never thought in this way. Uh, and then this is the way I think where the future may lie. And again, these are everything is my own interpretation. Um, so what really happened is there have been some milestones that has been achieved uh, from a technological point of view. One is that the microsystem, which is the Bashir's, you know, the little legs from the scaffold from the, uh, from the gel or our PDMS tails, these are all microsystems or, you know, submillimeter or micron size scales. So they got integrated with the living cells. So we put the living cells on the microsystem and the living cells got integrated with the living cells, uh, with the microsystem. And then the cell, cells evolved with an inter, uh, evolved uh, as time progressed by interacting with the microsystem. So whether it was the forming of the muscle tissue around those, around the legs of the walker, or whether it was the forming the muscle tissue around the legs or the arms of the swimmer or with their cardiomyocytes landing and, and becoming a synchronous actuator by interacting with the tail of the swimmer. But they all happen to be interacting with the scaffold, which is a microsystem, and became a total system as a whole. But at the same time, you notice the microsystem itself was evolving by interacting with the cells, which we didn't study that much at all. So the microsystem, meaning the tails of the uh, of the swimmer, or you know the legs of the of the of the walker. So what do I mean by microsystem itself is evolving? Is the original geometry we have evolved to build the microsystem is not there anymore after the cells cells form the muscle tissue. So in a way by creating the forces of the cells, the microsystem's geometry was changing as a function of time. And it could be a lot more involved because <clears throat> we can think of microsystem surface 
geometry, the surface properties might be also changing because the cells are depositing something on them. Their stiffness might be changing because the cells are putting force on the microsystem. So the bottom line is, if you think about the microsystem, just the one coming out of the lab without the cell, and after a week with the cell, the microsystems have changed because the, the simplest thing is the geometry has changed because the forces are involved. But there may be more subtle changes going on that we have not studied yet. So, so in a way, this is the first time where we have these fabricated microsystems integrated with the living components and they both evolved, they co-evolved with time. And this is the part that microsystems had used before with, um, with engineered stuff. So for example, here is a microsystem where you build sensors and actuators, you know, goes back for the last, you know, starting with the electronics industry. You, you take wafer, you put layers of films and you etch the film and uh, by continuously depositing films and etching the films, you end up having an electronic circuit or a, or a micro device, let's say an airbag sensor. Now, uh, it is all engineered. You put things on to the existing electronics and build up its functionality. Instead of it, now we can have a whole new paradigm where we have an array of the microsystems that might have coming out from the lab, from a clean room or whatever it is. But instead of putting thin films on them and etching, we now put cells with extracellular matrix also in an array fashion. But now instead of putting thin films, comes the cells, comes the uh, extracellular matrix. But now we don't go and etch them again. Now we let the cells interact with the microsystems and finish the rest of the processing, which we didn't do before. In the past, we had new films coming in, we etch, we do you know, fabrication and next fabrication, and finally we get an engineered product. But now we are kind of bring, integrating an existing microsystem bring the living component to it and let them co-evolve. This milestone has not happened before. And it's still in the batch processing mode because in the microsystems that we are used to, you have to have batch processing. You don't go one by one. Like when we create electronic chips, we take a 12 inch wafer, we have thousands of them. They're all co-fabricated at the same time, batch fabricated at the same time, which made the cost go down and efficiency go up, functionality goes up the computers become faster and faster, you pay less and less. And it was because the functionalities were all integrated. So the more complex functionalities are integrated together in the same chip. Think about an airbag sensor, having a capacity of sensing that when you hit something, then the airbag explodes. There are many, many components all put together in the same chip, they're integrated. Now that integration is happening with live components, the cells and the microsystems. You can still have batch processing, you can still have many, many of them, and you can have droplets of cell ECM mixture using an, an array of droppers that can do the same thing and let them co-evolve. So we have moved out from the continuous co-fabrication to a continuous co-evolution. Now, why do, you, why do we care? What, what, where would we, could you go with it, right? Well, there could be a significant um, quantum leaps with this kind of co-fabrication of living and engineered components. Well, first of all, uh, the cells that we might be putting themselves could be actuators, sensors, power source, all within the same cell. So we don't have to bring a battery in one place, sensing another place, actuate another place, and then talk to talk towards each, each other. Same cell has the power source, sensors, actuation. They're all in the same place. Everything is going on in the same location. These machines could get the autonomy. So once they're done, as long as you have the power source, energy source, they are on their own. These machines can acquire intelligence because you can bring neurons now, they can be trained. Uh, they may be learning as they, uh, as they survive over time. Uh, and many things that, you know, we talked in the, in the in ABICS, uh, kind of the blue sky, when Ron talked about idea of the kill switch to, you know, memory and learning, uh, punishing them or rewarding them. There's this whole domain of this new generation of machines that come from, that may in, introduce intelligence. 
And more common idea is this could be extremely efficient uh, because the amount of energy for processing by neurons is orders of magnitude, 10 or orders of magnitude compared to the most efficient transistors today. So we live with 100 watts of energy and yet we do an enormous amount of work in terms of thinking, processing, um, which a supercomputer would have to use, you know, megawatts of energy. Uh, so yes, that's why we care. But if we can reach to this dreamland, um, we might be able to have, you know, defined elements of these intelligent machines, and they could be some matrix, uh, you know, some some uh, scaffolds, some muscles, neurons, you know, or, or you know, all kinds of individual components, and it might be possible that we bring them together with some minimal guidance. And that guidance is sufficient so that they can begin to form a swarm or an array of these machines, uh, sort of kind of by self-assembling. So we bring some microfabrication, get to a point where the cells come in or collagen comes in or muscles come in, and then they would co-evolve. I'm just showing some conceptual picture here, but these machines could be any level of complexity. The substrate can have electronics built in, can have, you know, RF sensors, could have antennas. They could have all kinds of complexity. But the key point here is this substrate, which has gone through part fabrication, now interfacing, integrated with living components and co-evolving with time, giving the same possibilities as you know, uh, intelligence, autonomy, uh, and these are the features that we can get. Um, and these living machines of the future, you know, can have a multiplicity of components. Uh, one can imagine that in a machine like this, and it doesn't have to be a swimmer, it doesn't have to be a walker. These machines could have all kinds of functions, uh, but they may gain this autonomy from these multicellular systems together with neurons. Uh, so they could give us, you know, uh, computation, uh, sensing actuations, or maybe they could transfer signals to us, receive signals from multiple sources. Uh, so that's, that's, that's sort of the direction I'm, I'm thinking. Um, so again, what is the most unique thing about this kind of biohybrid systems with neurons and multiple types of cells is that I think the key element is neural connectivity. So in the most advanced uh, electronic uh, chip design, the biggest issue is connectivity. How many points you can connect from a chip? And even if you go to 3D, and IBM has done quite a bit of work on it, you're limited to, I think, 16 or some number, some very limited number of connectivities that you can achieve. Whereas in, in neurons, a single neuron can be connected to 10,000 other neurons. So this connectivity in three-dimensional space is orders of magnitude more than our current technology can provide, even with five nanometer lines, line, uh, line width. It's just, just scaling alone by minimizing the line dimension doesn't alone solve the problem of connectivity, whereas the neurons have does it by default, by, by evolutionary process. Uh, and the cells would self-assemble and grow, uh, they can heal, we might be able to have plasticity within these neurons so that they can learn as they progress. And of course, memory storage, computing density, and power consumption, they're all to our favor. So the question is, can we program this machine's behavior by conditioning by exploiting synaptic plasticity? Um, can we really have this minds in vitro that is part of these machines of the future? Um, and if so, then can these machines, oops, that was not idea. Yeah, can these machines have some kind of a readout that we could use? So for example, if we have a cluster of neurons and cluster of muscles, what things can we read out from? Can we use electronic, for example, uh, electro electrode arrays that we can read out from, or we can use the contraction of muscles as a part of the readout. And can these machines begin to learn from what they're exposed to? So when, I, when we shine uh, a, an image on the machine, on this large number of neurons, can they 
uh, can you remember it? If I show next time, let's say the image of a Mona Lisa, uh, and then if I show this image for several times and then take half the image, do I get the same signal? So in other words, can they remember what they have been exposed before uh, and begin to make decisions that that was Mona Lisa's picture that I have been shown before? And of course, the final frontier could be this, can these living machines have consciousness? Can they have some evidence of awareness, uh, self-awareness? And if they do, that can they talk to each other with some level of cognition? So that's sort of the, the long-term view that, that might be possible with these machines. So I will stop here. And I think I'm just a little bit over time. Great. So, uh, I'm going to say, do we have any um, questions? Uh, no question, Taylor. So when you talk about co-evolution, I, I find that very interesting. And I wonder what that means with respect to, you know, co-evolving machines in cells. What are, what are the implications for that? What are the time scales for that? What are the synergies by which they can co-evolve? Um, yeah, yeah. So there are different kinds of evolution, right? Right, different kind of evolution. So I think this co-evolution, meaning both the cells are evolving that we all know, but the machine itself, the one that we provided as a scaffold, it itself evol evolving, that is inevitable. For example, when the cells deposit something, they're always creating new proteins. So they would create new layers of things that we have, let's say we started with pure silicon, single crystal silicon. And the, the surfaces will be coated by something that we didn't program ahead of time. The cells are creating those, those biochemistry. Uh, the cells can create enough force such that the springs that we design as linear would go from linear to nonlinear domains, right? Some of these changes might be reversible, some might not, might not be. So when the forces are taken away, the springs will go back to where they came from. So that'll be reversible. But the chemistry that they might be subjected to, maybe corrosion, maybe um, you know, new material coating on top, they might not be reversible. But the changes that the electronics or, uh, or the microsystems are having, are going through, are making the cells work differently, cells react differently. So there's a dynamic crosstalk that might be going on. Uh, what would be the implication could we design it ahead of time? Could we predict what, what could happen to this combined system is, is I think an open question. I think we can, if we know the mechanisms, if we know what, is, what are the changes that the microsystem may go through. So imagine if we have a 100 nanometer uh, micro beam and that is being deposited with you know, something else, it's calcium on top, uh, another 100 nanometer. So the, stiffness, the frequency, everything will change. So we might be able to predict what would happen to the microbeam, you know, a week from now. Um, so then our design paradigm has to account for this potential changes. And do we reach to a steady state where the system behaves in a different way than when we, what we started with? It's an uncharted territory completely. I didn't think, uh, until last night, I didn't think about it. Here, I, I wanted to raise a couple of questions. Um, one is, you started out with the premise um, that you're going to have some physical substrate and then place the cells on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see the need necessarily for the physical substrate to start with. And in fact, I see that there, it, it constrains the ability of, of, of the structure or the M cells to adapt or, or to evolve in a way. Because especially if it's silicon, I mean, they're not going to be able to degrade the silicone in any way. Um, so they can't change their morphology. They're sort of confined to a particular shape. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, was, that was one point I wanted to make. And then the other was that um, you, on the slide you've got to put right now, you know, can, can they talk to, to each other with, with cognition? I, I know you mean talk in quotes, but it's yeah, interesting yeah, of course, yeah. to think about, you know, how, how M cells might be able to communicate with one another. I mean, they could mm -hmm. communicate through secreted factors, mm -hmm. through electrical signals, um, and and probably, you know, we, we, we should think be thinking about 
you know, what are the most pr primitive ways of communication that we could build into an M cells? Yeah, regarding your first point, Roger, uh, I brought silicon to make the point that until now, most of the electronic circuits and things that we are familiar with um, have been using silicon and putting things on top of it. Uh, the real point here is that we don't have to have a scaffold. We have to have something where the cells are landing somewhere. And that probably could be some biomaterial, some, um, some shape, some, something that we're, it's not a flat petri dish anymore, something that we have engineered. And that thing would guide the evolution of the cells. But my point was the thing that we had provided is now also changing because the cells are doing something to it. And that doesn't have to be silicon. Silicon probably is never gonna be used. It's mm -hmm. too hard material and not biocompatible and so on. It probably would be something, some biomaterial. But I brought the idea of design by bringing electronics is that the idea of this integration, uh, because electronics survived because of integration. Uh, we could integrate many functionalities in a chip that is very small and by layering of, uh, of functions. Here, we are providing something that is now integrated with biology, and they're both changing as a function of time. In what I was thinking so far is, you know, we, we make the swimmer, the swimmer tail doesn't change. Uh, it's permanent, uh, or the walker doesn't change. But now I'm thinking that there is a possibility that we might bring into our consideration design that let this change as well, linearly or non-linear, it doesn't matter. So that, that was the point. Silicon was just as an example. And for the talking, um, yeah, I, of course, you know, paracrine signaling, uh, endocrine signaling, those things we, we are already using in biology. But I think in these kind of machines, we could think of hydrodynamic interactions where, uh, you know, one does something and that hydrodynamic forces is felt by the other one and that makes it to deform in some way and then respond also. Mm -hmm. um, so more biophysical interaction, or it could be um, electrical interaction. But the moment the neurons are involved, uh, there could be a cascade of events happening involving memory, learning processes uh, that are now part of this communication. Uh, a group of neurons might have seen a neighbor doing something, you know, a few days ago. Does it remember? And does it prepare for this new signal to come in? Does it respond differently for the same signal? Mm -hmm. um, it's not clear to me how, but I think when the neurons are involved, uh, when memories are involved, when synaptic plasticity is involved, then it's not a linear communication anymore. There could be because of the learning processes, they, uh, I'm, to trivialize it, let's say in hydrodynamic communications, when the first time the, the tail was bent because another tail was bending nearby. But then it, if, it, if it happens several times, maybe the neurons may not fire anymore. Maybe it's habituation now. Maybe they feel like, well, I don't have to fire anymore now. So that's the sort of thinking I'm, I'm then the direction, right? It's habituation or that comes with training. Right? Mm -hmm. But some that's signal yeah. goes back and forth between two clusters of cells. That's right, that's right. And there's a memory involved. And, and of course, you know, do they show some sense that they are aware of themselves? There's a consciousness. And how do we read it out? In fact, I was thinking that, you know, given what's happening around us now with COVID and you know, Black Lives Matters and so on. I was thinking that, you know, is it possible to create the systems and make and create stresses on them? You know, uh, the, the social stress that we go through as we are going through now and see the response of these systems and can we learn from, from their response? How do we make an experiment that, that mimics the, the stress that, that we go through in our own lives? And, and create those scenarios now.